now that you understand that we learned that 2.4 can be 80% aerobic, super compensation, periodization, three things that we learned from module one. Now we need to ask ourselves, how then do we know that we are training in the aerobic zone? Now, this is very, very logical, right? You ask me to train in aerobic zone now, how do I know why it's aerobic zone? Okay, so that here comes the training zone thing, right? We're going to learn about training zones. We're going to learn how to define the training zones. We're going to show you how to use our calculator and how to carry out the benchmark test. Okay, so now why is there a need for training zones? No choice, right? Because we need to know if you're training the right, correct system, right? And the gold standard is how? We have to, because based on the chart that I show you, the only thing that is different is that we see lactic acid produced in the aerobic system. So therefore, if you can detect lactic acid in the blood, then it will reveal to us which system you are utilizing to produce energy at any point in time. Okay, so what's the gold standard? Well, gold standard is laboratory testing. So that's me in the lab test in the Singapore Sports Institute. I do this so many times and it's very painful. You run on a treadmill and it basically makes you run progressively faster and faster with continuous heart rate monitoring. They will check my blood lactate every five minutes. So they keep pricking my finger and they squeeze the blood and they check. Okay, and then they'll plot the chart of the amount of lactate. You see blood lactate concentration, they'll plot, 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 okay? Then they use a medical model to convert this into a line and subsequently create the threshold, all right? So it will show me, okay, based on this, uh, based on this work intensity, this speed, uh, you are actually starting to produce lactic acid here. And once you start to accumulate, then you are in the anaerobic zone, okay? So this is how the gold standard. Unfortunately, this is very expensive, right? Okay, but again, there are many, many models in literature of how to define training zones. People can define what, from three all the way to seven. This is very complicated, right? Now, I think the easiest that we can use is the three zone method, okay? Zone one, zone two, zone three. So now we need to ask ourselves, okay? How do I know whether I'm in zone one, zone two, or zone three? Okay, very simple. So zone one is aerobic. Basically, it's easy. Lah, huh? So if I say aerobic training means you're talking about zone one training. There is no production of lactic acid. You see, the line is flat. Now, in the lactic threshold, Okay, at this point, is what we call there is no accumulation or rather minimal accumulation, okay, because the speed at which lactic acid is being produced is actually being cleared by the body very efficiently. So there's not much accumulation. But once you hit zone 3, this is where the lactic acid accumulates. So you're clearly in the anaerobic zone by this time, okay? So what's the implication? The implication is this, for optimal training, right, you need to know your training zones. If not, you may be over or under training, right? And then your super compensation will not be effective. So you need to know training zones. Right, if you want to have efficient training, right? Now, the gold standard is a lab test. You see, people can charge you $199 for a lab test. Now, the question is, do we really need this expensive test? Well, honestly, when I was in US, I was training with Olympic level runners. They never do this test, okay? Because they are very comfortable with understanding how their body feels and they can accurately determine whether they are in which zone just by feeling. And at the most, they use the heart monitor to guide them, okay? So, in our method of prescribing this in our program, right, we will not be using expensive tests. We just be using your age as well as a benchmark testing. Okay, now, so well, now we need to ask ourselves two questions. Now, if we ca I cannot use the blood lactic acid to test myself, that means even when I run, I cannot go and check it, right? So then, therefore, what metrics right, can we use to determine whether I'm in the correct zone? Okay, and then after deciding what metrics, right, we need to understand how can we establish the cutoff for that specific metric. Okay, so what can we use? Now, the surrogates that we can use, because we cannot check lactic acid, very impractical, right, during training runs, we need to ask ourselves which can we use now. There are only a few options, guys. You can either use your heart rate, you can either use a running pace, you can use your feeling, you can use a talk test. There are only four things, nothing much, okay? So we need to find out which one is the best surrogate to replace lactic acid testing, okay? Now, number one is heart rate. Now, heart rate is very, very uh, good, right? Because number one is very accessible now. Almost everybody can... Uh, easily obtain this optical heart rate center. Just 10 years ago, at the start of my training, everybody must buy this heart rate strap and it's very, very uncomfortable, right? But now we have this optical heart rate sensor. Number two, it is objective. Objective means it does not tell you a lie. A heart rate is hard, what it would it, it, it's just what it is. It's not by feeling, okay? Number three is real-time feedback. Straight away, you look at your watch, you know exactly what intensity you're running at. Okay, but there are disadvantages, okay? Number one, you need to wear the watch properly. It needs to be snug on your wrist, okay? And number two, the problem is with heart rate is that there is a catch-up time, there's a lag time. That means if I ask you to sprint 100 meters now, your heart rate may show that it's quite low. Only at the end of the sprint, then suddenly your heart rate showed up, right? That's a lag time, so that's a disadvantage. That means if you're doing short repetitions, right, using heart rate is not accurate and not effective at all. 
Okay, so understand the advantage and disadvantages. Number two, we can use pace. Now, pace you can measure two ways, okay? Number one, you can either measure on the track. That means you know exactly 100 meters is how many seconds you can exactly run the correct pace. Or number two, you can use GPS watch. Okay, both got the pros and cons. Now, the advantage is that objective again, right? Whatever speed you're running for the 100 meters is, 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 is that speed. You cannot, it's not by feeling. Number two, the advantage if you happen to be running at race pace, then you also get psychologically allows you to get used to race pace. So that's, that's great also, right? And thirdly, it is very accurate if you run on the track with manual pacing. Because if you break down your 1km pace to every 100 meters and you keep, keep running at that speed, take a number of seconds for every 100 meters, right? You end up being very, very accurate. Okay, more accurate than GPS. Because GPS, uh, because it uses satellite, whenever you take a corner, it actually uh, overestimates. So it's, it's not as, as accurate, okay? Now, if you use a GPS watch, right, it's not going to be suitable for track intervals. Okay, the reason is this, right? Because again, the GPS is not going to be accurate on the track because of the turnings. Okay, number two, if you use the GPS for a short distance, like speed training outside again, it's also not accurate because it requires a significant amount of uh, data points for it to even out, okay? And the disadvantage also, it may not correspond to climate. Now, why am I, why am I saying this, right? The heart rate, when it's very hot, the heart rate goes up. It actually gives you a good idea of how intense that run is. But the pace can be very unforgiving. That means if you say that I want to run zone 3 at this pace, and even though it's very hot, you are forced to run at that pace in order to, to say that you have been training at zone 3. But if you use heart rate, then heart rate will also take into consideration how hot it is, because then you'll be training in that appropriate zone. Okay, so there's pros and cons, right? So we have talked about heart rate, we have talked about metrics. Okay, and the next one is a talk test. Now this is the most inaccurate, right? Because it's very cheap, of course, right? But then it's like asking yourself, okay, how do you feel? You feel easy, okay? But let me tell you, many people I've spoken to, they tell me they run their easy runs very easy, but I ask them to show me their heart rate file. It's like 170, 180. There's no way it's easy. Okay, that's because uh, our inner calibration can go off course. Once you keep forcing yourself to tell yourself this is easy and you're running very hard, end up your body will just accept this is easy and end up you are not training effectively at all. And of course, it is inaccurate. Okay, so now to balance out all the pros and cons, right? We, our program utilizes both heart rate and pace. Okay, this will optimize uh, everything so that you get the base, best way to classify your zones. We will use heart rate for zone one and zone two training because these are longer duration runs. Okay, and these are runs where using heart rate will also help to capture the climate that we are running in to make sure that you're running the correct zone. Okay, now, and then we will use pace for zone three to ensure you're running in the zone three pace. Okay, all right, let us sync in for a while. But essentially, we're using heart rate and pace to classify zone 1, zone 2, and zone 3 in our program. Okay? So the second question now is this, right? You say zone 1, zone 2 use heart rate. Okay, zone 3 use pace. So the next question is how can we then establish a cutoff? Okay? So for the heart rate, we'll be using a latest 2012 uh, formula. Okay? Um, it, this study uses a different uh, calculation to establish the heart rate zone. And there is a plus minus 10 beats per minute accuracy. Okay, you can argue that it's not accurate, but honestly, from my experience, okay, 10 BPM is, is more than enough. Okay, in fact, we chose this formula because it actually, after we compare many formulas, this actually gives a higher heart rate, meaning that I would say that you will tend to um, err on the side of, un, uh, of, of uh, not, not under training. Okay, that means it's slightly higher than most formulas. And we have allocated zone 1 as less than 75% maximum heart rate and zone 2 as 75 to 88% maximum heart rate. Okay, this is the calculation that we use in our calculator. Okay, and why are we not using this for zone 3? Because of the disadvantages. If I ask you to do an interval now, you know, your first 1-200 meters is going to be low heart rate. It takes time for you to catch up. Then end up, you are not sure why you are training. So it's, it's not useful. Okay, and also you'll not be able to get used to race pace. For the zone 3 training, I also want to zoom in, right? At the same time, get used to 2.4 km race pace so that you're maximizing that zone 3 training. Not just training the anaerobic system, but at the same time getting used to your real race pace. Okay, so that's why we're going to use pace for zone 3. 
and how do we do that? Well, we always need to do a benchmark test. No choice, right? We need to do a time trial to know where you are. The time trial will allow us to, to prescribe you the best uh, pacing for you. So we're using the Pete Regal's formula. So once you run a 1,200 time trial on the track, three rounds, okay, then we can use the formula to predict your 2.4 km race time. Okay, and from then, that will be your training pace. What's the advantage of using that pace? Now, number one, you will then get a chance to get used to your 2.4 km race pace. And number two, this will definitely fall into your zone three effort. So I'm not concerned about that. Okay, you will definitely fall in your zone three effort and then you can get used to your 2.4 km race pace. Okay, so why do we choose 1.2 km? Actually, no good reason. Okay, because at the end of the day, we need to seek a balance, right? Obviously, the closer the test distance, it's going to be more accurate. Right, if I ask you to run a 2.4 km now, obviously it's going to be a better, uh, extra, better um, uh, estimation of your fitness, right? Of course, but it's very mentally challenging. So therefore, we just choose a three lap, right? No good reason. Uh, but it's psychologically quite good, all right? You just focus on first lap, second lap, third lap, and then that's it, right? I think it is 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 doable for most people. And how would I want you to do it now? So you warm up 10 minutes in zone one because the calculator can actually produce your zone one based on your age only, right? So you warm up in that zone. After that, you stop and reset your watch. Then you start your time trial, three laps. So focus on the first lap running at a comfortable pace. You maintain in the second lap, and then the final lap, you will go as hard as you can. Now you record the time of the entire 1.2 km, and then you warm down, okay? And what will happen? is that we can then calculate your 2.4 km predicted pace, okay? So in summary, right, the training zones that we're using is this. So zone 1 is less than 75% maximum heart rate. Zone 2 is 75 to 88% maximum heart rate. And zone 3 is a predicted 2.4 km pace based on your 1.2 km time trial. Okay, so this is a calculator uh, demo. Let me, let me show it to you, right? So we will give you the link later. But basically, this is it. Let's say I put my time trial, my time for the 1.2 km is 3.20. And I say my age is 35. And I press calculate. Okay, what will happen is that under zones, you will see that it will come out here. Zone 1 less than 144. Zone 2, 144 to 169. This two is based on your age. And finally, zone 3, it will come out per km. Okay, based on your time trial for your 1.2 km. And I've given you this number so that you can, those who want to try on the treadmill, you can try. Okay, I'm not sure how easy is that. Okay, but you will basically have to increase uh, the speed to this speed and continue the run. Okay, and then over here, we have given you the pacing. So that means if you're doing your workout, you can actually utilize this pacing to help you uh, use for your training plan. Okay, so this is a calculator. So if you change the numbers here, okay, and you say you're 40, it will calculate, and then you can see your zone one and everything will change accordingly. Everything will change accordingly, okay? So, and everything is calculated for you so that you can use the training plan that we give you easily. All right? Okay, so, so summary here, right? Number one, I think we need to be individualized. You need to know your training zones for effective training. If you do not know your training zones, you are just, uh, you know, anyhow shooting in the dark. Okay, number two, we realize that there's limitations of each method of zone determination, right? Gold standard is lactic acid. No way we can do that, right? And our program try to maximize the pros and cons of each method. And we use heart rate for zones one and two and use pace for zone three. And if you use the calculator, it can easily uh, show you everything, okay? Uh, with one click of the button, all right? Okay, let's see. So uh, what you can do from here, okay? What you can do from here, guys, you can either write your own program now. You keep, now I've given you all the principles. You can write your own program. Those who have already your own program, you can modify it to ensure you, 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 you balance out the correct ratios or you can follow our program, which is essentially a two times a week, 30 minutes each session to maximize your time in training for 2.4 km. 